Welcome, everybody. My name is Abe Bonowitz. I'm with the Abolitionist Action Committee, and I've been tasked with helping to run this little media event that we're doing now. And I want to welcome everybody to the 20th Annual Fast and Vigil to Abolish the Death Penalty. Yeah. 20 years ago yesterday, a man we were going to hear from in a little bit walked out of prison. 20 years ago, four people stopped, came to this spot to start protesting the death penalty, to indicate these two dates that we are here for these four days, two dates, June 29th, the anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court striking down all the death penalty laws, and July 2nd, the anniversary of the first of those laws being upheld by this court. Okay, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, this is my 20th fast and vigil. Uh, I haven't missed a day yet, and I figured this was not a good year to break that chain. Um, it was after a journey of hope, uh, first journey of hope in uh, Indiana in 1993, where Rick Halperin, Marietta Yeager, and myself uh, ended up going to Dallas, Texas for a speaking event. And we sat around the dining room table, and for those that know Rick Halperin, he's a real death penalty historian. They started talking about how we needed to commemorate the Supreme Court decisions. And after sitting around the table and talking for several hours, we decided that we thought it would be neat to have a fast and vigil commemorated Supreme Court decisions with Furman and Greg, and to just hold a presence in front of the court, pass out information, give out education. We got hold of a few other people we knew would be interested in something like that. Uh, the first night, there were four of us showed up. Rick, Marietta, myself, and Kathy Ford from California. It's really great to see how this organization, this event has grown over the years. And um, I think it's uh, a very important stand that we're taking. I thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, but there's another kind of death row survivor um, than just somebody, than, than the exonerees and the people who were wrongly convicted. There's also the survivors that are the Furman survivors. The reason that we're here on this date, June 29th, is because, what is it? 41 years ago, June 29, 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the death penalty laws in this country, which took more than 600 people off the death row, changed their sentences to whatever the next highest sentence, and many of those people have actually ultimately been freed, and one of them is here with us today. So I want you to take a moment and listen to the story of this next person, this death row survivor, Chuck Colhane. I don't know about a story. I don't know. I'll say a few words. Tell us a little bit about how you found out what happened. Oh, okay. Well, 41 years ago today, I was on New York's death row with four other men. And interestingly, four out of the five were never charged with an actual shooting in New York. And the one man who may have actually done it was so drunk when he committed his crime that he didn't remember. So that was the status of the death penalty in New York. And uh, it, it applied just to the killings of peace officers. So four out of the five people who were there were like co-defendants in cases involving the death of a peace officer in New York. And uh, interestingly, well, I won't go into the case itself, but we were never exonerated, uh, the five in New York. But Tony Amsterdam, who argued the Furman case, yes. after reviewing the record yes. of my, my trial record, he said, he said that case, this case represents a miscarriage of justice. But I don't, I don't, uh, speak from the perspective of, a, of, a, of an innocent person almost executed, but from a person who had made a journey through death row. I was in prison for a pretty serious charge to begin with, and then got the charge of attempted escape and murder, uh, in which a deputy and a prisoner shot and killed each other, and I was shot in the back of the head while unarmed. But 41 years ago, a guard on death row came up to the cell door and quietly said, he said, the Supreme Court 
almost the death penalty. And he smiled, you know? And I said, wow. I said, all right, we were, we were hoping for that, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't something that was in the bag. But Anthony Amsterdam and others worked tirelessly for 10 years in different states to stop the execution. It was a, a de facto moratorium. And the decision was just like wonderful. You know, I, I saw it as a legal and social evolutionary step for, for the legal system and for this country. And then was very disheartened to see it uh, uh, brought back three years later with Greg. And why was it brought back? It was brought back because political leaders like Nixon, George Wallace, Ronald Reagan, made a big stink. And they said, oh, we need the death penalty. There'll be anarchy in the streets. I mean, these were the exact words they were using in their press releases. There'll be anarchy if we don't have the death penalty. So these are, these are politicians who played on people's fears and, and, uh, and were able to bring it back, you know? But the resurgence movement is faltering. In the last six years, six states have abolished the death penalty, yeah, so the so the trend is the trend is heading our way. Uh, uh, I look forward to speaking to some of, some of you in a in a person to person. But uh, and I have a poem that I wrote in 1972. It's kind of long, but maybe before I leave, I could read that. It's called Last Christmas for Death Row. And I wrote it on Christmas Eve, 72. But I started it off with a quote from Albert Camus. Uh, from his book, Reflections on the Guillotine. And he says, neither in the hearts of men, nor in the manners of society, can there be a lasting peace until we outlaw death. Yes. And that certainly applies, well, it applies to the death penalty, but it also applies in, in another context to wars. And there's a, there's a correlation between our government's policy overseas and policy in the states where they're killing people. Yes. You know? especially like southern states like Texas and, you know. Anyway, it's great to see so many people here and uh, I look forward to talking to you and enjoying the program. All right, hi everybody oh. and welcome. And yes, this is my first trip and I've come from Atlanta through the Open Door community run by Ed Loring and um, Murphy Davis. And that's where I learned about the death penalty. And one of the main reasons I'm here, we live in a great country. There's a lot of educated people here, a lot of scholars. We have a lot of colleges, universities. And I, nobody has convinced me that killing um, people that kill people is going to solve anything. Amen. Nobody has been able to make sense of that to me, not yet. And then I noticed today, it says equal justice under law. When I go to prisons, I see a lot of poor, yes. black yes. women, yes. men. Yes. And don't forget poor, because that does include everybody else. There's people in prison that want to live in this country that are in prison. Yeah. And it just, it doesn't balance out to me. I really think we need to look at our system. There's gotta be something wrong with the system Amen. that tries to tell us that if you don't have money, if you have black skin, if you come from another country, you're bad. I'm not buying that. And what my hope is today, that all the scholars that come here, the people that are educated, the people that stand behind these walls, these signs, will wake up and realize we can't keep killing. Enough is enough. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back here again with all of you because this is the, the one event that I do in terms of the death penalty every year where I know all the first names of everybody. And, and we all share a community and we all profess our belief and stand out here and, and sweat and uh, just, just hand out leaflets, starve, yeah, <laughs> fast. And it, it's just great to be back rather than in a board meeting around a table with a cup of coffee and a latte. Uh, this is where the movement is and this is where the death penalty is going to end, yeah. right here. Yeah. And we need to bring that message to all of our local state affiliates. 
we need to have not only Georgia represented, but we need to have Tennessee. We got Tennessee. We got Georgia here. I know we've got Virginia here. Uh, we've got the state of Washington. We got the state of California. And we got a lot in between. But we should have 50 states here. There should be 50 people just from the various states around here because this is where the death penalty is going to end, folks. This is the this is where these nine people make that decision, and we're moving them. Six states in the last six years, and we're moving on. Yeah. There's now 18 states that don't have the death penalty, Yay. and uh, I, I just invite you all to, when you go back to your local states, to make sure that your affiliates send people here next year and tell them that this is part of the training for their interns. This is part of the training for their staff because there are staff all over the United States from Amnesty International and the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and we need to get them standing staff here to be part of this demonstration because this is where the death penalty ends, at the U.S. Supreme Court. It Thank is to be together and just look at us. You talk about hope. We know what we can do because we got everyone, yes, me and you, and we go do it. And we also know that 41 years ago, those people who sit in great big black robes and a half blind were able to do something and 41 years ago they got rid of the death penalty and we can do it again 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 and it won't take us 41 more years that's why we're here that's why we won't go away i would like first of all to invite an awareness of some people that are not here today through the leadership on death row in Georgia of Marcus Wellens there are a number of Georgia death row prisoners who in the days that we are here are joining us in the fast so we not only have us here from Georgia but we are linked in prayer and fasting with a number of men on Georgia's death row. And that's a mighty good thing to do. My wife, Murphy Davis, and I began to uh, work on death row 36, 37 years ago, right after the Jimmy Carter uh, law for the death penalty was upheld by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, most unfortunately, but like so many in our society, uh, turned backwards, turned back the clock. We're now dealing with that, of course, not only with the death penalty, but with so many issues in our society. We feel linked, as Martin Luther King would make us feel linked with the one fabric and the just injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we know at three o'clock this afternoon when at the CIA building, there's gonna be a huge, courageous action against the drones. We know that there's a relationship between the drone and the needle, the drone and the electric chair, the drone and the rifle. All of this is of one piece. We even are of one piece. We got the unity of community. And we got so much hope that these folk cannot extinguish the light. So let me say a couple of things about death row in Georgia. And I know that in the next several days, Murphy Davis will be speaking to you as well as Terry Kennedy uh, from the Open Door community. We have been visiting uh, there since uh, since the new law was was uh, set aside. Oh, I'm sorry, not aside, but was reinstituted. We have been visiting people on death row. Our community, in conjunction with the Jubilee community, we have a shared graveyard. We have buried a number of death row prisoners. Back in the days, uh, we would bury their body, and in these days, we would bury uh, people's ashes. It is inconceivable and ungodly how many people on death row have no one to write them, no one to visit them, no one to stand with them as they're taken down to the chamber and murdered by the state, and at least we can stand forward for a funeral and a burial. There's so much we can do. We got right we got to visit we got to root the power and passion of resistance to the death penalty in relationships with people who are on death row we can do it we can 
overthrow situation has gotten worse, as it has all over the state. The wardens have taken away contact visits, except for clergy and lawyers. The spirit on death row since the execution of Troy Davis has been difficult to maintain. People, there is some depression, but I want you to know, and I know you know, because we know, and we go, go, this. They know we're here all over the country. Death row folk know we are here. We help others keep hope alive, and I tell you what, we're going to put them on their butt. And 41 years ago, they got rid of it. I would say next year they're going to get rid of it. I can just have a vision of Clarence Thomas coming forward. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, life is good. Life is right. I'm from Pinpoint, Georgia, and my pen and my point is going another way. We ain't going to have the death penalty for another day. Hallelujah, 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 amen. Today is the anniversary of the Furman decision. Today is the anniversary of that date when they struck down the death penalty in, um, in four states that wanted to write new laws and have the death penalty. They had to write new laws, and those laws were affirmed. Four days from now is the anniversary of that, the Greg decision. That's why we're here. I want to ask the folks holding this middle banner here to stand up and swing that banner around so we can kind of see what's going on on the other side there. Because we're talking about death row. Yes. Yeah. We're talking about executions. We're talking about situations like Texas, where this past week we had the 500th execution in Texas. 500. How many of those people were really culpable of the ultimate uh, of a crime that deserving of the ultimate punishment whatever that ultimate punishment Not is one. how many of those people may have been actually innocent how many of those people in killing them did we damage so many other people yes. around them yes i want to share a little bit about the collateral damage of the death penalty, not just when we have a, a, a person who's innocent being executed, but any time we execute somebody, there's collateral damage. I want to invite next to speak both Terry Steinberg and, uh, and Delia Perez Meyer to come up. Both of these wonderful women people they wrongly convicted actually Terry son is no longer on death row but he's facing it again isn't he and in any case they can tell you their stories a little bit both of them will be sharing their stories at longer periods of time um, later uh, one of the evening teachings this week but, but these folks are here today and can represent also the families of everybody on death row Steinberg. I'm here from Fairfax, Virginia, and um, like Abe said, I have an innocent son on Virginia's death row. Actually, he's been moved off death row temporarily as they are trying to recharge him with new charges, six new charges, to try and convict and sentence him to death again. I fully agree with Terry Kennedy when he said that this country is full of intelligent people. It is, but I tell you that 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I didn't think about the death penalty except that I thought it was awful. I thought it was sad and sick because I couldn't believe that we would take somebody out of a box who'd been rendered helpless and walk them down the hall to inject them with poison and kill them. To me, it made no sense. But as a young mom with young kids, it didn't pertain to me. And so I didn't think about it. And so the only way that we are going to get people to think about it and realize the horror and the collateral damage of the death penalty is through education, is through what we are doing today, trying to let you know what it feels like to have been experienced with the death penalty, living that nightmare, knowing that every day your loved one is locked in a box in isolation. I've not touched my son since 2007, yet my son is has been found innocent of his crimes, we came within 45 minutes of bringing him home. The look on my 
children's faces as we got the call saying that they changed their mind is a look I'll never forget. However, I had to think about my poor son thinking that he came within 45 minutes of freedom after 12 years of being wrongfully incarcerated. So I come here today just like I came here 11 years ago. You people saved my life. I could never have walked this walk for 12 years without every one of you who have supported me through this nightmare, through this journey. So thank you so much for all you're doing. I'm going to take the energy that you have brought me again, and I'm going to face this trial coming up at the end of this year. And hopefully next year, something I've been promising for many years, my son will be here with us. Here's my friend Delia. She can tell you about her brother. thank you very much to everybody who is here today, especially the people that are holding all these signs and that stay in this hot sun and don't eat for five days. It's just an amazing thing. The love and the support that you all have given us is truly amazing and it really keeps us going. And um, my brother's name is Luis Castro Perez. He's been on death row for 15 years, for those of you that don't know. Um, he is an innocent person on death row. He was falsely accused of murdering three of his best friends in September of 1998. Um, the good news is, is that he has a wonderful attorney and that the Innocence Project has taken his case. And of course, we all know that that doesn't always solve our problems, but we are very hopeful and very grateful to, to everyone, uh, abolitionists across the world, that are fighting for us. Um, some of us are just getting back from uh, Madrid, Spain, where we attended the European Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, which was an amazing event. We don't really realize how much support we have around this world, but there are people around the world that are thinking of us and praying for us, and very, very grateful for that as well. On Wednesday, we did have a very grisly milestone of the 500th execution in Texas with Kimberly McCarthy being put to death. It was a devastating death for all of us, as each one of them are. This one was particularly particularly devastating because they had given her several stays, and then at the last minute, the Supreme Court denied her, and she was executed. So it's been a very difficult week, a long week, but I'm very grateful to be right back here with all of you all, and thank you again so much for being here. God bless you. I want to thank you all for coming uh, today. and spending all this time in the hot sun and fair-skinned boy he doesn't need to be in the sun but this is important to me 28 years ago i sat in the prison cell waiting to die for a crime i didn't commit it was all based on a witness identification of a man that was six foot five curly blonde hair bushy mustache tan skin and skinny <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't this robust in 1984, but my hair was as red as a fire plug. I'm six foot tall. I do not burn, I do not tan, I burn. And it turned out about 19 years later, when I was finally released and 10 years after that, the real killer was five foot six and 160 pounds. We talk about fallibility and this sign over here that what the justice is saying is, lofty building behind me is that factual innocence is no reason to stop a death sentence properly rendered. Dang. 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 Well, I got something to render for them. 142 men and one woman have sat on death row innocent, and we have executed many. Troy Davis, Cameron Todd, Willingham, many more. I sat and talked to the folks in Texas about his case, and they executed him from my plane, touched back down in Maryland. In 1993, as a matter of fact, yesterday was my 20th anniversary of being free. I had prosecutors withholding evidence about another suspect. 
My case was overturned by the Court of Appeals of Maryland. I got a new trial. I was retried this time. They sought the death penalty again, didn't get it. Wound up uh, spending eight years, ten months, and 19 days in a prison cell in a place I didn't belong. I honorably discharged Marine with no criminal record or criminal history. But that was my life. Five months before they released me and the DNA results we came back. I think it tired uh, Terry Steinberg over there. She must be going through. My mother passed away. I was allowed to go for her, to her, see her body in handcuffs and shackles for five minutes, flanked by two guards with nine millimeters. And this was my life. From the time I was arrested till the moment I was released, I told anyone and everyone I was an innocent man. I used to sign my correspondence that way. Respectively submitted, Kirk Noble, Bloodsworth, A period, I period, M period, an innocent man. I've wrote books about it. Books been out about it. Stories been out about it. Documentaries have been out about it. But the problem is, I would love to stand here and tell you that my story is unique. But it is not. It is far from it. We have an estimation of over 1,100 plus people who have been found innocent in the United States. 316 DNA exonerations so far, and we still want to execute people. It is a farce, and they are bamboozling the American public to believe yes. it's been a deterrent yes. any time since it all started. Yes. In 1984, I was 22 years old, newly married. Next thing I know, I was fighting for my life. I realized early on, and I never really had an opinion about the death penalty. I came from a very conservative side of the eastern shore of Maryland. and. Folks down there, you know, just hang them high, hang them hard, and hang them fast. That's how they wanted it to go. I said, you wouldn't want to hang anybody, though, if he was an innocent person, would you? Well, I don't know. Maybe that's the price we pay for democracy. Well, I'm a Democrat, and that's not no democratic way to treat a citizen in the United States. Amen. I stand here in this sun, in this beautiful backdrop of this wonderful nation's capital and think to myself how close did I have to come before it dawned on me and it didn't take long when that 300 some pound door slammed shut and my life was over at 23 years of age. Eight months from the time I was arrested till the, till the trial was over and sentenced I sat on death row. Never heard a soul. One of the most brutal crimes in our state history. But I have seen so many men like Suja Graham from California, Ron Kiney from Michigan, Ray Crone from Arizona. The list goes on and on and on. I'm going to be speaking here this evening about 6 o'clock, and I'm going to try to get my whole story out to you. But before I end today, I just want to tell each and every one of you this. You have to keep up your struggle in this fight. Yes. You can never stop. Right. Yes. Yeah. You must on. get up, sit up, hold your head up, and yes. never give up. Even when it gets rough, you get tough. Yes. Yeah. Because the simple fact is, as I look out in this crowd, these folks walking past us, people having a nice day on a Saturday here in the Capitol and just walking along, but so was I. So was uh Ray Crone, so was all these other gentlemen and women just walking along, having their self a life, and the next thing you know, they're on death row. I think everybody can be a witness to this, and I stand right here as this emblematic of the fact that we don't need a death penalty anymore. Amen. Amen. I want you all to go with this thought in your head to tell your friends to keep standing up for people like myself. If it is no reason to stop a death sentence properly rendered, then they need to render another idea. They can't keep rendering the same ideas. This thing ain't work. It ain't deterred nothing. It ain't even stopped a rat from going in the trap. It hasn't done anything for us. Not one damn thing. And I tell the, the folks up in this big building behind me, you know, you better get it right because I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you and I'll stand up against you till the tides rolls over this 
great nation as high as the building. They'll never stop me because I'll get a boat and tell them what to do then. I stood in, uh, I sat in this gallery in, in Maryland and I was overwhelmed with emotion as I am right this minute. Overwhelmed with emotion and I sat there and I remember, you know, you really have an effect on people when the next day the newspaper article in Annapolis says that the senators have Kirk Bloodsworth fatigue. <laughs> Must have been doing something right. Well, I've got uh, policy fatigue. I've got death penalty fatigue. Yes. I've got the criminal justice system fatigue. Yes. I got a Justin right. Wolf sitting in there, and he let the need to let the man out. That's my fatigue. Yeah. Yes. I have got so much fatigue over this damn death penalty. I don't want to see it no more. I don't want to think because guess what? Well, we did. They gave Kirk Bloodsworth the death penalty. They will never give it to nobody else ever again. Yeah. Ever. Not my state. Voted unanimously. They almost abolished the thing. Then he tried to slide back and get a little referendum. The same county that sent 19 to 21 people to death row in the only state out of 23 counties. That was Baltimore County. The same people that sent me to death row. I thank each and every one of you for coming out here and braving this sun. And I'll talk to you more this evening about this. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for coming. It is a pleasure to look out and see so many standing here in this hot, hot heat. I want to thank you, and I'll see you all later. Take care. I live in Anchorage, Alaska. A member of Alaskans against the death penalty. And the hat I'm wearing says, fry fish, not people. And we have an annual fish fry every year. We're bringing up Kurt Bloodsworth in July to speak to the people in Alaska, and I encourage people here that are have, have say in the organizations and coalitions around this country is to bring people like Kurt to your state and help get that education. In 1985, my grandmother was murdered. Four girls knocked on the door on the pretext of wanting to take Bible lessons. My grandmother let the girls in the house. She was murdered. The state of Indiana sentenced a 15-year-old girl by the name of Paula Cooper to die in the electric chair. I originally supported that decision, but I became convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that my grandmother had been appalled by the fact that this girl was sitting on death row and there was so much hate and anger in the community, and that she would have had love and compassion for this girl and her family. I didn't have that sort of love and compassion, but convinced that she wanted me to have it, I begged my God to give me love and compassion for Paula Cooper and her family and do that on behalf of my grandmother. And that short prayer changed my life. I got involved in an international campaign to help get Paula Cooper off of death row. And in 1989, the Indiana Supreme Court did take her off of death row and committed her since to a number of years in prison. And I'm very grateful to say that a week, last week on Monday, after 28 years in prison, Paula Cooper walked off out of prison. She's now a free person. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. This girl is not the same person as she was when she was 15 years old. She's changed. And she wants to contribute to life, contribute to society. And I hope that the people of Indiana will help her accomplish that. The death penalty has nothing at all to do with the healing that murder victim family members need when a loved one has been killed. It just continues that cycle of violence. We've got to break that cycle of violence. I came to healing through forgiveness. And as I travel around the country and around the world, I preach 70 times 7. To forgive, to forgive, to forgive, and keep on forgiving. It doesn't mean you condone terrible acts of crime. It means you lose that desire for revenge. I believe you're supposed to hate the sin, but love the sinner. Hate the sinner, murder, hate it with a passion but we're not supposed to hate the sinner. And if you have love and compassion for all humanity, you're not going to see anybody put into the death chamber and their life taken from them. It's impossible. Thank you. Dear sisters and brothers, it's so inspiring for me again to be here in this community of healing and hope. On September uh, 20th, 1999, my brother Paul was murdered by a mentally ill homeless man named Dennis Sutar. My brother had uh, worked and ministered at the Mercy Housing and Shelter Program for 10 years, where he had served the poor. 
And as he was leaving work on that Monday afternoon, he was approached by this brother who often frequented the soup kitchen and shelter. And he was repeatedly stabbed by Dennis. And then soon thereafter, my brother died. There's a double tragedy here with the unspeakable loss of my brother, but also the man who killed him, Dennis Sutar, who fell through the cracks of our system. There's enough money for weapons and war and big convention centers and stadiums, but there's not enough money to help the homeless and the poor. Six months before this tragedy happened, the state of Connecticut cut funding for the mentally ill homeless. So there was nobody to oversee Dennis's care. He bounced from soup kitchen to soup kitchen, shelter to shelter. He was hospitalized at least three times, diagnosed with severe paranoid schizophrenia, and then released out onto the streets. He was a, clearly a danger to himself and to others. It's a societal disgrace that somebody like Dennis would fall through the cracks. Yes. Sometime after my brother was murdered, my mother and I were able to meet with Dennis's family and to pray with him. Despite the unspeakable anguish and pain that I felt in my heart, I can only turn to my faith and to the example of people throughout history who have walked this road. And as others have said here, Jesus for me was the uh, reference point thought about Jesus being given the death penalty of his day and what was Jesus doing on the cross when he was being executed he was putting into practice that seemingly impossible command to love your enemies and so I knew that in my heart if I was to say if I'm a follower of Jesus then I have to follow this way yes of mercy, of compassion, and forgiveness. And every day, that's what I try to do. I often fail, but I try every day. I want to uh, ask you to please uh, as remember my brother and remember all the victims who have died from violence and war and oppression. Let's also remember all the victims' families everywhere and for those who uh, have perpetrated these terrible acts, and we pray for their healing, and that they can know God's forgiving love, and that they will be held accountable justly, but never to kill them, yes. never. I ask you to pray for Dennis. He was found mentally incompetent to stand trial and is now in prison, hospital in Connecticut with a life sentence. I ask your prayers for his healing. I'll be telling more of my story on uh, Monday night, so thank you very much, and let's never, ever uh, uh, give up, and let's always keep our eyes on the prize and stand for, for life and for justice. Thank you. A number of you have participated. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for making this happen. This is an incredible group of people. This yeah. ra this rally we had right here, we don't we say that we're gonna do this at noon, but it's not pre-planned. All these people you just heard from just happen to be here. And I think that's absolutely amazing. That those those strength of characters, those stories of of reconciliation, of compassion, of struggle, of trauma. Those people are here in our community, and I celebrate that, and I celebrate everyone that's here. Uh, and I want to thank you for participating in all the different ways that you have.